Okay. Hello and welcome. This is uh, Migraine Canada. Ask your pharmacist uh, again. Uh, we are very happy. And this is the first time I can say with good weather in Canada on a good weather day. I'm hoping that uh, you are um, you have joined us already. Um, my name is Heba Hani. I'm your host for the Migraine Canada and Ask Your Pharmacist series. And today it gives me great pleasure to welcome our very special guest, uh, Dr. Dragana Skokovic Sonjek. Did I get it right or Sonjek? You did. The only thing you missed, I'm not a doctor, I'm a pharmacist. So that's, the R is from Dragana, not the doctor. <laughs> not from doctor, okay. <laughs> so uh, apologies uh, because I keep on saying the dr. Um, uh, welcome to um, Migraine Canada and to Ask Your Pharmacist. Um, Dragana is a pharmacist. Uh, she's a clinical pharmacist and she's currently practicing in Hamilton in the um, uh, family health team. Is that right? That is correct. And, yes. Um, this team is uh, actually a collaborative clinical practice where you have a pharmacist integrated into the clinical setting and this is where she provides care and provides support for people who need um, uh, to work with someone focusing on probiotics and uh, adding probiotics to their clinical management of infections and other conditions. Uh, Dragana's um, work, we were just talking before we started and you said that you have been working um, for more than 30 years. You started in Croatia and uh, then you moved to Canada and got licensed in Canada in 1995. So a long, long time. <laughs> and uh, you started as a general pharmacist, I assume. And then in 2015, uh, you discovered this, uh, or uh, you've decided to take probiotics to the next level in Canada and not only in Canada, but in Canada and the States. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Probiotics seem to be your passion, similar to how migraine is what I now feel is my biggest passion. And uh, you have actually um, made such an impact on how we use um, probiotics in Canada and in the US that now you have clinical guidelines. You have actually guides for people who want to prescribe probiotics. Um, and this guide is not only used in the US and, and Canada is also used all around the world. Welcome. Thank you Thank very you. much for accepting to be with us today. I know migraine is not what you are usually working with, but when we started talking, we saw that there's a, a great a great uh, wealth of information that our, our community would definitely uh, benefit from having you with us tonight. Well, thank you again uh, so much for inviting me. I like to talk about many different subjects and probiotics is one of the passions that I have. As I mentioned, as you mentioned, it's uh, I've been involved with uh, educating on probiotics for a long time. Uh, the clinical guide for probiotic products available in Canada started in 2008 and then expanded in US in 2015. And it's the resource uh, uh, table or, or guideline that has been updated every year ever since. So it's a, definitely a work of passion that has been accepted and recognized globally uh, because we do try to look at the evidence and, you know, for, those, for specific strains and then help uh, and assist providers and clinicians when they're deciding what to recommend to their patients. So I believe there's definitely lots for us to talk about today. Um, and, and we can maybe start with uh, uh, some of the kind of a basic things about probiotics, because it's a uh, very interesting and a buzzword these days. Anything that has to do with probiotics, microbiome, microbiota, good bacteria, it's very um, sexy. Everybody likes it. Everybody, you know, you put something on a label or a headline, everybody's interested. Uh, the fact is we do not know enough about it. And we do know there is a huge impact and we still learn a lot. But more we learn, more we realize there's so much more that we do not understand. So this is why we are going to try to um, kind of pull the curtain back and understand some of the issues and, and challenges. Maybe get some good advice to take home and think about what is it that I can do at home 
that will improve my gut microbiome and it's supported in a good way. And why is that important? And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've always, when we studied, I've always heard that uh, all disease starts in the stomach. Uh, that's something that's like thousands of years ago, the first um, uh, doctors or the first health um, philosophers, uh, they started by talking about how we need to start in the stomach. And this microbiome is a question that I get from a lot of my patients. Like I get uh, the question, uh, like, which one should I take? And in pharmacy, usually uh, we used to get these prescriptions that have an antibiotic and we add a probiotic to them just to ensure that there's no super infection. But when it comes to migraine, there, there's a lot of our patients that live with migraine, but also with other um, uh, GI issues where there's also a lot of medications that they're taking that that is affecting their stomach and they feel that there is a need for us to understand a little bit more about the microbiome, about the gut health and, and about anything that we can add to our arsenal uh, of, of um, uh, you know, tools that we can fight or we can actually manage migraine with. Um, do you want us to start with our stream? I will say first, um, hello, I have, uh, um, we have guests from uh, Ottawa, we have Calgary, uh, we have, um, it, it looks like we have uh, um, already started to have our viewers. Welcome to everybody who's joining us tonight. Uh, please uh, write your comments, your experience, your questions in the chat, and we will try to address them as, as soon as we see them or if we can um, uh, at the end of, of this talk. Thank you very much for joining us again. Dragana, would you like us to uh, uh, start with a small presentation about what is what are uh, uh, probiotics? Sure, perfect. That would be great because, again, uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, the gut microbiome and all the questions that we receive, uh, the, quite often the question is where they come from and, and why we need them. And do we always have them in a gut? Because, you know, in our training as a pharmacist, in my training as a pharmacist years and years ago, the only bacteria we wanted to do with, we want to kill it because it was causing infection. So you will learn a lot about antibiotics, but not enough about probiotics. And I have to have to say that, you know, 30 years ago, I was fairly ignorant about probiotics and specificity of strains. I would tell my patients to eat yogurt if they are taking antibiotics because we don't, did not know enough at the time. So we are learning more and more. And, um, you know, from our birth, we start picking up the bacteria from the environment, from mother, from caregivers, uh, you know, playmates, etc. We start kind of uh, populating the gut uh, with different kinds of microbes that live in our gut. So not only stomach, but small intestine, large intestine, lower we go in the gut, we have more and more bacteria living very happily, hopefully inside the gut. Their purpose, we'll talk about that very briefly, is really to support our overall health. And, um, you know, we all have our unique blend of good bacteria with some bad bacteria. And there are also viruses and fungi and phages and other microorganisms inside. But uh, you have different, I have different. We all have our unique kind of a fingerprint of the bacteria in the gut. One of my colleagues, Dr. Emma allen Verko, she calls it poop print. So we all have our own unique poop print inside the gut. So we are not really all the same when we look at the bacteria in the gut. So just looking at um, uh, uh, probiotics and microbiome, and you know, some of my first slides explain the importance of keeping that diverse and abundant uh, bacteria in the gut. So... Um, how does it look like? I like pictures, I don't like slides with too many uh, words. But uh, when you look at this kind of uh, um, illustration, the pink uh, line of cells illustrates the lining of the gut. These cells are, they look happy and healthy. They are tied together. They are uh, separating the inside of the gut from the outside. Uh, and on top of those cells, you see the thicker mucus layer and then different outer mucus layer with the green little uh, rod shaped um, and different kinds of shaped bacteria. That's our uh, happy gut microbiome. 
when we feed those bacteria good diet, which is um, what we call prebiotics or soluble, insoluble, fiber, polyphenols, things like that. It loves to eat it, loves to ferment it, break it apart. And in that process, we pro they produce different kinds of metabolites. We call them short chain fatty acids and others. It's a, um, minerals and vitamins cannot be actually absorbed without bacteria in the gut. And when they produce those uh, metabolites, those metabolites actually communicate with our underlying immune system. Uh, they say the 60 to 70% of our immune responses are regulated by gut. But also they communicate with the uh, uh, cells that are connected with the nervous uh, system, central nervous system, and they can communicate directly with the brain. So there's a huge uh, uh, research going on in the gut-brain connection. But we also uh, produce large amounts of our serotonin in the gut as well. So we cannot really look at the gut as separate from everything else. It affects the rest of the body, you know, dramatically. So this looks like a healthy and diverse gut microbiota, and this is a happy patient. But this is what happens if we lose that diversity, if we lose the abundance of good bacteria in the gut, or we change the diversity. That can happen because we do not feed it well. It could happen because of the medications, antibiotics, stress, all different kinds of things can affect the gut microbiome. And what happens then, you lose the protective layer on top of the cells inside the gut. Those cells do not stick together well. There is communication that is really not desired with the underlying immune system, even with the brain uh, connection. And we start triggering inflammatory responses and you know uh, pain responses as well at the same time, which is observed in IBS, observed in other conditions. So this is just a quick illustration why we need to keep these bacteria in a gut happy. And again, as I mentioned, each microbiome is unique. Uh, we are really like to keep those uh, communities happy and, and diverse. Um, when it comes to probiotics, we always like to think about uh, shortcuts. You know, if the bacteria in the gut is not well and, and happy, instead of kind of thinking about how can we feed it better, we start thinking about, hmm, how about I give you some good bacteria and see what happens? And this is why we've been seeing huge increases in research with probiotics. And uh, probiotic, by definition, is a live microorganism when it's given in adequate amount, provides a health benefit. So for something to be a probiotic, it has to satisfy these, these um, live adequate amount health benefit. We have to see all those three for the probiotic or something bacteria to be a probiotic. So quite often, um, eating yogurt is a good option. It's very healthy food, but might not actually satisfy uh, all the requirements to be labeled as a probiotic. So keep that in mind. Um, when it also comes to probiotic, there is a confusion with the names and many people and many of my, my colleagues are confused because microbes and specifically probiotics are defined by genus, species and strain. Long, complicated names. These are example, Bifidobacterium is a genus. So it's a big, huge family. Uh, species is Lactis. And then strain is actually first and last name and SIN number or social insurance number for this particular person. So we know exactly who this is and what it does. And the last part is the most important part. Quite often neglected, not really paid attention to. This last part will tell us what this bacteria is going to do in our body. For illustration, and I like to use this one, even though it's a bit dramatic, maybe over dramatic, but illustrates my point. Um, Escherichia coli is something that we are familiar, we probably have heard about it. So genus is Escherichia or E. coli, species is coli. And when you look at different strains, you have completely different outcomes. The first strain in a green box, Nisle 1917, is one that is actually used as a probiotic. It's a, a capsule and comes as a liquid as well. It's used globally and it is approved and used for inflammatory bowel disease, specifically ulcerative colitis. Very good evidence, very safe to use. Second strain is the one that most of us have. It's one that kind of lives within us, but it doesn't cause any problem most of the time. 
And the last strain is extremely harmful strain. It can cause bleeding inside the gut. So it, that one kind of is almost the infamous strain because 20 and some years ago, this last strain of E. coli got into the water supply in a small town in Ontario, Canada. And population of that town got sick. Everybody got sick. Lots of people ended up in hospital and some people died. It's called a Walkerton uh, tragedy or Walkerton scandal. So it's a, um, that, that kind of illustrates that difference between strain could be difference between life and death. My hope is that we will never get enterohemorrhagic E. coli in our supply of supplements, but this is just why we need to know the strain. So we always are looking to see you know, what is the reference, how we can figure out what strain to use. So basically, this is why, as you mentioned, in 2008, I started with my colleagues this project with the probiotic guide. Um, and there's a Canadian version and US version. Canadian has a French and English, US only English. Um, the information is available as a mobile app and on, online as well. And um, it lists uh, products, lists uh, strains in it, lists references we, we use to assign the indication of a specific product. And again, information changes rapidly, so be updated annually. So when we ask this particular guide, and I was looking at Canadian and US, is there a probiotic for migraine? So there is a probiotic in US, not available in Canada, on a shelf, but it can be ordered online. Um, it is a product that I think is actually made in UK, and it has 14 strains uh, in it, but they are very defined and specific strains. It's a mixture. It has a, a level two evidence in migraine prevention and reduction of, of frequency and severity of migraines. So when you look at the studies done with this particular product, it was a study done uh, and there were, you know, less but less than 80 patients and they included episodic migraines and chronic migraine patients in eight to 10 week period, 45 showed a reduction in attacks versus placebo group. And this was actually the only study uh, that was showing good results out of 70 plus studies done with different probiotic interventions in migraine. So. The research in migraine and probiotics is really new, and it's still, uh, I think we have more to go and more to learn about it uh, as well. But don't you think that 40 patients is like 40 episodic, roughly 80 or 79? Is this enough for us to try a product like this? If, if so, uh, so the small number in that particular study was the reason why they assigned a level two evidence for this particular uh, product for this what indication. What, that what means does that level one evidence would be very strong evidence, very well designed study, uh, and you know sufficient amount number of patients in a study. This one. So was, I have, sorry, uh, because we have a, a question from Jasmine. She's saying, "How would one get a hold of that probiotic? Is that something if it's not available in Canada? How how can we try it? And then is this a, a probiotic that you would take every day, and and that would be used? Um, would that be used?" Like so, so the, the the product can be, if you are in Canada, it can be ordered online, which is a pharmacist would like to discourage ordering online, but this particular one can be ordered online. And I have had few patients with good results with this particular probiotic. Uh, it's not inexpensive, so keep that in mind. And in a study, it was given every day as a single dose and uh, then was measured after 10 weeks period. So experience of my patient is that they actually um, would improve and then they would stop taking it, have it on hand for to take maybe uh, a couple of times a year for a month. That's what they would do, kind of almost take it quarterly for a month. So different kinds of experiences. And again, it's probably not for everybody, but this is to illustrate, to, to show you that if you're looking for specific targeted probiotic for migraine, there might not be too many options that we have. Um, and again, I would encourage you to, uh, the Alliance for Education on Probiotics is the, uh, who supports the publishing of the guides and any update, any change will be posted through this website. 
So it's something that you can probably follow or, or you know, easy access to the clinical guides is through this aprobio.com. So I can probably, we can stop sharing the slides. I think we started to have some questions around this. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's so the let's, question. Let's maybe ask. Um, I, some, someone asked, what is the name of the probiotic? I know you said it's a bio cult, so I'm just... That is correct. Uh, yeah. But I saw online that it's called Migria, Migria M-I-G-R-E-A. I'm not sure if that's the right one. That's the one I found online for them. And they say they also have, in the same formulation, they have B6 and uh, magnesium. Usually in migraine, we recommend... Um, Magnesium with B2, so I'm not sure the B6 link, um, uh, and and um, it it looks like it's reasonable. It looks like it's thirty six dollars on online. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm seeing the right one that you you're referring to. So I would suggest I know it's complicated, but I would suggest to go online, check it on a, on a clinical guide, see what strains are listed. If they have the same combination of strains, and most biocult has have these. 14 strains in most of the products, make sure that this is the same list of strains in the product you're ordering. Um, addition of, of things like a B6 or magnesium, uh, it has not been tested in the same tablet or same capsule. So I cannot comment whether or assume that this, this new product will have the same effect. I'm hoping so. However, whether the uh, other ingredients might impair the viability of strains or not, unless there is a proof or study posted, we don't know. Okay. So the question, the next question was, is from Judy, and she's saying, my naturopath and functional doctor say it's not wise to introduce pre or probiotics without knowing what's going on in your gut microbiome first. What are your thoughts on this, Dragana? So that is a good question. Um, first of all, um, this probably leads to the uh, next step the doing a gut microbiome at home testing, which is um, something that we do not recommend. Um, gut microbiome testing, it's challenging. Uh, even in a research setting, it's, it's uh, still, we don't have the good standard procedures for that. We are gathering lots of data globally. There are big, huge projects uh, looking at gut microbiome and see how we can harvest and figure out what's in people's guts and how this changes from the morning to night for one person or how it changes regionally, geographically, etc. So many things can affect that kind of composition. As I mentioned, everybody is unique. So the testing, I would definitely discourage to spend your time and, and money on that. And is it expensive? Uh, is, is it they, something that costs those, a lot of money? Those tests are very expensive. There was a, a big scandal in the US. There was a company that uh, actually was, was um, uh, they had to shut it down because the FDA actually uh, had some legal process against them because of the shady practices, I guess. So anyway, um, um, <laughs> I think I don't want to be like, you know, saying that, that you know, uh, playing on words. Kind yeah. of. <laughs> so basically, basically, this is to, or it would be great if you can you know how we do the, you know, B12 testing in the blood. So, oh, you're low, you can take it and you fix it does not really apply to the microbiome. Um, so you mentioned prebiotics and probiotics. I do discourage taking probiotics unless you know what you need to to, to uh, address and you know what you need to 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 you take for the desired outcome. However, um, eating foods with the uh, live cultures in it is good idea. Any time in life, any time uh, um, uh, for any reason. So you know, good yogurts, kefir, uh, sauerkraut. I know that patients with migraines have to be careful with certain fermented foods because of the tyramine in it but they are also fermented foods that do not contain tyramine. So you know, that will be a good option. However, as I mentioned, feeding the bacteria in your gut, good um, diet, good prebiotic would be excellent idea anytime. Um, prebiotics are present in different foods, artichokes, leeks, onions, um, bananas, uh, uh, most of the fruits and vegetables have prebiotic fiber in it. Um, psyllium is great, prebiotic fiber, artichoke uh, root, uh, Jerusalem artichoke root. I'm just trying to think what other foods have it. Um, you know, even are, grains, are grains good or beans? Are they good? 
beans yeah. are actually also good uh, uh, amount beans and grains have also lots of soluble fiber that sometimes it's not the best uh, prebiotic but again it's good for digestion anyway uh, inulin is excellent even like as a supplement as a powder to add a metamucil uh, uh, or psyllium fiber uh, there is also resistant potato starch uh, I believe it's in Canada called MS prebiotics. So there are good prebiotics with the good evidence behind it that can be easily added to diet if you're trying to avoid and look what foods you're taking. So prebiotics will actually feed your good bacteria. It might take some time to get those uh, colonies up and, and you know strong, but it's always a good idea to, to actually ingest good prebiotic. And um, again, if... If we don't, if everybody has their own print of microbiome, then how would we know which one they are missing? If if everybody is unique, if if everybody is different, how would we decide which strains are needed for what? Basically, that's correct, and this is why why the testing is really uh, um, not you know we can test, we can figure out things, but. What to do with these results, we don't know. And most companies will actually sometimes take advantage and give you the tailored, you know, individualized probiotics to, to support, which probiotics do, ne do not colonize the gut. They never colonize the gut unless you're a newborn baby. Then you might colonize the gut. But if you're adult, you cannot colonize the gut. You should not colonize the gut with probiotics because that will be actually a problem. Uh, you know, when I like to kind of when I explain to my patients, I like to say, you know, when you think about probiotics is like getting you have your company, somebody's coming for a visit for Thanksgiving, you have a great time, you you know, feel great and they leave those friends coming over their probiotics, they make you feel better and then they leave. They don't stay for you forever. So imagine if the probiotics would colonize the gut, we would have a mess. So this is something that is uh, kind of, uh, if you can expand on it, just for for us to understand a little bit more. So when I do add a probiotic to my diet, it is it doesn't stay there. It no. just works on changing that ego ecosystem that is in my gut, kind of, to make it a little bit more balanced until my body is able to like. Like uh, the, the question I have from Lisa, she says, I use a, pre, a, a probiotic and wonder if it's not the right combination to eliminate the amount of migraine uh, headaches that she's suffering. So this comes um, uh, th this comes to me, it, it makes it a little bit um, difficult to understand. So first, does uh, does uh, Lisa need to be taking a daily probiotic if it's actually something that just goes away just to keep it going? And how does she know if it's the right combination? So uh, first of all, if you have improvement in symptoms, that means whatever you're taking, it's working. Also, if you are supporting the microbiomes in your gut with a good fiber diet, prebiotics, you can attempt to stop probiotic and see if symptoms would return. That would be a great way to assess whether you need to stay on it or not. Um, if you remember the first slides I showed you, so if you take probiotics, so getting something very strong, that is going to start breaking down prebiotics and fiber, producing that mucose layers, uh, allowing your own bacteria to thrive. And it will not stay, it will not populate, but it will allow the rest of the bacteria to have a good good start and continue proliferating on its own. I know it's kind of confusing and quite often I see some resources, even like those uh, designed for healthcare professionals say probiotics colonize the gut, they do not. So that's that's one of the things that you know, have to keep in mind. Okay, so... Uh, again, to go back to Lisa, so if she's using a probiotic, does she need when someone is living with migraine, other than this one that we saw that there was a small study on, if she's using um, a probiotic, how would she know if this is 
number one, does she need to take it every day? That's the question I always have. Is it forever that I'm going to have a probiotic? Or do I need to kind of recycle or diversify the kind of bacteria that I'm introducing? How do we do this? Um, so based on symptoms, that's, that will tell you whether you need to stay on it longer or not. If you are trying a probiotic, taking it daily is usually a good idea. Uh, for any reason. For example, you're trying to uh, minimize the risk of uh, diarrhea with antibiotics. You take it throughout your uh, antibiotic course and for two weeks after minimum, and then you can stop. So those will be kind of a uh, timelines. For migraine sufferers, if you have, uh, uh, for example, gastrointestinal symptoms, if you have diarrhea or constipation or intestinal pain or abdominal pain with migraine that or maybe precedes the migraine, it could be IBS related, um, in, uh, irritable bowel syndrome related. Um, you might select a probiotic for IBS. However, once symptoms improve, um, I usually suggest you try to stop it and see what happens. Because hopefully you are supporting your own bacteria with a good diet and you do not need help from outside. Okay, so the answer would be stop and see if there's a change in your migraine. How long that would it take for her to see if there's a, a change? Usually quite, quite uh, uh, soon, a, a couple of weeks after discontinuing, if the symptoms start coming back, then you would go back on it. Um, similarly to the patients with IBS, for example, uh, some of them refuse to discontinue probiotics because they feel so much better on specific kinds. Uh, but some of them will go off for a couple of weeks, a month, three months, and then maybe take it for a week or two only when needed if there's a flare up. For some, certain chronic conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, those patients might need to take the probiotics regularly mm -hmm. because they cannot really uh, support their own microbiome appropriately to maintain the, the uh to keep the infl inflammation and uh, uh, flare-ups under control. So they might need to stay on it longer. There is really no uh, side effects on staying on probiotic that is helping you longer, aside from the cost. That's really something that I always am concerned about as a pharmacist, with my patients spending time and money on something that, that they might not need. Okay. And um, I, I have Judy who's saying, and you have touched on this, she says, unfortunately, I uh, fermented foods are triggers for her. And um, uh, how does she know, or how does she know which medications um, are, or which, which probiotics are from fermented versus non fermented? Even I don't know this how can I tell from looking at a pack if this is fermented or not fermented? So uh, if I did, this is interesting because most of the probiotics that are listed in the guides with good evidence do come from human body. They originated from either um, mother's milk or from uh, a healthy gut or from uh, urethra of healthy women or vagina of healthy women. Uh, different parts of human body are actually sources for most of the strains that we have uh, um, in present in strong and, and evidence-based probiotics. Uh, certain strains will actually help ferment food. So they are just the strains that you know, ferment milk, you know, break down the lactose in milk so that it becomes yogurt. So it's easier to digest. But if you let this yogurt sit longer and becomes cheese, then the other parts of fermentation will happen. Then you have products and, and byproducts that will actually possibly trigger migraines. So that's why it, it's a bit tricky. Okay. Um, so I have one question that was earlier. I'm not sure if we go back to it. Uh, just so that we don't forget to answer this question. Um, I think the question was about, um, uh, I think it would, uh, it was about poop transplants. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was Suzanne is, is asking, so what about that? Is that something that is 
similar to taking a probiotic or so uh, uh, fecal matter transplant or FMTs uh, have been uh, studied and and uh, uh, you know I actually worked with a few of the researchers at McMaster University that uh, have done lots of great studies with this particular approach and it's different kind of gastroenterology departments across globe have been doing the, the research with this. Uh, initially, we were extremely excited uh, about the results. We were seeing inflammatory bowel disease uh, with the fecal matter transplant uh, uh, from healthy donor to a patient. Uh, and then with the C. difficile uh, treatment, etc. But we also have found that sometimes you can actually harvest bad things from the donor and then implement in patient that is already not in the best health. So this is something that uh, uh, is still really a, a subject of huge research. We are learning more about it. But what is encouraging is that there have been some advances in, a, 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 I'm not sure, I don't want to say like refining or, or changing or analyzing what is harvested from healthy donor and making it a probiotic. So there is a, a first FDA approved what we call precision probiotic or that kind of a next level probiotic that is basically a blend of bacteria harvested from a healthy donor. And it's now going to be used uh, in, a, in a very sick uh, individuals as a probiotic. So there are a few of them down pipeline and the one first one has been approved, I believe a month ago or two months ago in, in, in the US. Well, this is beautiful news because as you well know uh, migraine canada and 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 in this community uh, we are very big on hope and what is next and what is how is the science going to help us going forward and you are bringing more news or more good news to us saying that it's going to be even more precise and it's going to be much better what we understand about uh, probiotics. Before we started this uh, chat, we were talking about how bad uh, is the funding that is going into research that is not based on medication. This is, we need to understand our bodies a little bit more to understand what we can do and there's not enough money going in there. And that's why something as it, it looks like it's it's it makes sense for us to study a little bit more and understand a little bit more but you're saying there's going to be precision medicine and that is excellent news i i'm also hopeful that it's going to be reasonable and accessible to all um our community members um i have um like uh, we have another colleague uh, Perveen uh, gulati is a very very active pharmacist who's very interested in migraine and is always supportive and, and is, is also asking a question is there a basic um is there a basic probiotic that we can start everybody on is there one that you would say if you want one kind of that would work for most of the community members which one would that be so this is an excellent question. So first of all, this reminds me of the question, what probiotic is good for general health? Uh, if you are generally healthy or like to maintain health, you do not need to take a probiotic as a supplement. That's number one. Um, but if you're asking about a good probiotic to start, if you have migraines, there's only one I would recommend to try which is one that we mentioned in the slides. Uh, I'd hate to, to promote the brand names, but Sometimes I have to use brand names because I cannot tell you 14 strains that is in that particular product. Uh, and I have no financial ties with any of those companies. So the BioCult uh, would be one I would suggest to try if you have migraines. That's that. Uh, but if you have, uh, if you are concerned for any reason about the state status of your gut microbiome, make sure to feed it properly you know, minimize stress, sleep well, all those things that we know, common sense that nobody wants to do, uh, will actually support your uh, gut microbiome. Uh, eating slowly and mindfully, I know, avoiding irritants, avoiding uh, too much alcohol, uh, antibiotics, corticosteroids, uh, and certain medications might affect the microbiome. Also avoiding sweeteners. This is something that we have learned recently. Uh, artificial sweeteners, all of them will actually have a negative effect on a gut microbiome composition. So those kind of things, avoidance and you know, ensuring whichever way is easier for you, 
to feed uh, bacteria with the good good food. Um, sometimes, you know, even healthy individuals might need a probiotic. If you're traveling, you might need something that will minimize risk of traveler's diarrhea. There are quite a few of them listed in a guide. In the fall, usually people are concerned about flus and common colds. There are few probiotics for kids and for the adults that have proven effective in minimizing risk of community infectious, uh, infectious disease. Um, so, you know, those things might be good options to try. So those are kind of things that I would recommend, but I do not have one that's like, oh, everybody should be, should, should be on it. So there's no such a thing. So then I possibly can go to Shruti's question and Shruti does have symptoms, but not diagnosed with IBD, but does have chronic migraine. And she said last year she had to go on way too many cycles of antibiotics last year. And she now feels that her gut health is completely off. Uh, classic migraine, progressed to migraine with aura and vestibular migraine. She just started taking probiotics, but she's not sure how to go around about this and how to recognize when it is working. Mm, okay. Uh, because uh, 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 she mentioned uh, the, uh, the res repeated courses of antibiotics and potentially how much of it is IBD or IBS? IBD. She's not diagnosed, so she okay. has... It, she, okay. she does have symptoms, so she's not sure. She doesn't have a diagnosis, but she does have symptoms that okay. uh, she's, she's identifying. Yeah. As, uh, so, so we usually uh, uh, we usually suggest that uh, you know people do follow up with a healthcare professional. That's for sure. But, oh, sorry. Uh, she just corrected me. She said the IBS. Okay. So she did confirm IBS. <laughs> So the, you know, the development of IBS after the you know repeated courses of antibiotics is common, or after the uh, you know if you have the, the uh, viral infection of the gut, you know post viral IBS is very common as well. So if there's no uh, red flag um, uh, symptoms such as blood in the stool or you know uh, weight loss or something like that, then you can assume that is IBS and you can do the trial of of probiotics for for IBS specifically. But if it does not work, that 12 weeks definitely needs to be followed up with the physician. And I'm thinking also what I'm finding with the patients, if they uh, can control the uh, abdominal symptoms, they quite often um, have and report improvement in headaches and migraines. So okay. it's, you know, we do not recommend probiotics for IBS to prevent migraines, but patients do report mood improves, you know, uh, um, the, the frequency and severity of, of migraines improve as well. Okay. And then she had another question saying she just caught a piece of content on Instagram where the person said that sometimes certain bacteria and probiotics can trigger attacks, something to do with histamine production. Can you comment on this or do you have an, have you heard of this? Can you tell us a little bit more about histamine and gut health? <laughs> Uh, so uh, again, this is um, it's a, it's a, probiotics are not always uh, um, product product uh, do not always contain uh, safe and proven ingredients, and quite often they combine with other ingredients that might be questionable. Um, the histamine production, uh, uh, the probiotics will not trigger the proven probiotics and safe probiotics approved by FDA or have GRAS status or NPN number in Canada will not trigger the histamine production. That's, I, that's what I would like to say. As I mentioned, they have actually anti-inflammatory uh, 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 function. They really support production of serotonin. So definitely uh, beneficial effects uh, have been observed. You said something interesting and you said something about children and babies are, you know, they need to colonize. Maybe a lot of our community members as well have uh, children who are living with uh, migraine. And in childhood, a lot of it comes as abdominal migraine where they have the symptoms of nausea, vomiting, tummy ache, a little bit of headache, a little bit of photosensitivity, and, and uh, their tummies are very, very sensitive what do you think about probiotics in children? What, what, what are you, how do you, how do you go around this? 
So there is a, definitely lots of research in, in using probiotics specific strains in the pediatric population for different reasons. Functional abdominal pain, uh, some of the symptoms with the functional associated with functional abdominal pain uh, would be headaches and mood changes, irritability, etc. Uh, so there are probiotics that can be used for functional abdominal pain in kids as well. Uh, always a good uh, uh, idea to try. What I also like that certain probiotic strains have a multiple effect in kids. I'm not sure why we observe this in children more than in adults. So those proven strains, for example, there are a few that will help with the diarrhea, constipation, uh, minimize risk of uh, uh, infectious disease, uh, help with functional abdominal pain, even uh, prevent childhood eczema and endotopic dermatitis. So kind of when you look at it, wow, so because probably kids do uh, tend to react and respond to probiotics, you know, with the full system, with everything that is in their in their body. Uh, so choosing one, I would say, refer to the guides. Uh, choosing one that has a, a, a those all symptoms, especially specifically functional abdominal pain, would be a good idea. Um, and I, I'm going to ask again: Is there one that you? Go for. <laughs> so I know you don't want to mention brand names, but unfortunately, even for me as a pharmacist, you go to the pharmacy and there are shelves full of probiotics. And so, yeah, I understand completely. And again, uh, I'll tell you that first of all, uh, let me tell you this particular uh, probiotics is sold. Um, there are a few, two of them actually, uh, um, globally, I think, in under uh, everywhere in the world with the same name. One is called BioGaia. Okay, one of the so really... that is the one I give my patients when it's a child yeah. and if they have colic and or if they have... That's correct. And second one, second one would be Culturel, which contains uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. So that one would be also a, a good option. So one or the other, not in combination. Um, but you're right, you know, sometimes as my own... Uh, curiosity i walk in, in any pharmacy i walk in anywhere uh, especially in canada us uh, i check the probiotic aisle or shelf it used to be a small part of the stomach uh, section now it's like shelves and aisles of probiotics what is uh, very distressing and disturbing for me to see that um, most of those products do not even have strain listed uh, others have strains that have no evidence um, the, the claims sometimes are will be it's kind of over, over the top. But the, the worst part is when if the product does not have a strain listed on the label, what it means is that they actually can change the strain if the one that they're using becomes too expensive or not available. So if you, for example, have a good result with some unknown probiotic with no strains listed, might work for you a couple of months. And if you continue, it will stop working because they can change the strain without telling you what they did. So, I mean, you talked about that um, guide that you have. And the guide is for education, but you also provide the same information for patients. So Shruti is saying, what strains? And I have the same question. If I want to find out which strain to use for what, is that part of the guide that you provide through AE ProBio? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, um, so sorry, I will just... find the link and I will put it in our uh, chat, I think, uh, for AE ProBio. And yes, that's I correct. That will help. Uh, if you go to aprobio.com, the landing page will get, give you links to the guide, U.S. guide and Canadian guide. Um, and if you go to the website, you can actually do a search button, drop down list of all the indications. Then you can narrow down your uh, uh, you know, selection or you can just go one by one and see what each product can be used for. All references are listed. Studies are listed. Everything is listed there. And we do encourage people to check the studies if they are like to maybe chat more or take the guide to their um, physician or pharmacist and discuss it with them. Okay. And, and that is something that we also as a community try to say, if your pharmacist doesn't know this, you know where to send them to learn mm -hmm. a little bit more because we need the pharmacists to actually be able to support you in your community. Um, we were talking about a case before you started about a patient who went to a natural uh, um, 
store or a natural health store. And she was recommended a very expensive probiotic. And you want to tell us about this case? As a so, functionary. yeah, this, this, is, this is not an unusual case. Uh, but today I, I was working and the patient, uh, I was not seeing patient for probiotic, but with my medication review, I ask what prescriptions, what over-the-counter medications they take. This is patient with diabetes. And uh, we just recently started her with a specific medication that works by a kidney for controlling her diabetes. She's not well controlled uh, patient. Uh, her sugar is very high. So she was taking, uh, started taking this particular, she said probiotic combination. But upon, you know, search, I found that this is a, a product recommended by the health food store uh, clerk to her. Um, it says symbiotic, so it had uh, different kinds of, of uh, extracts. It had a very potent cranberry dry juice extract in the capsule and uh, did not state any strains in it. It says uh, dry uh, kefir cultures um, and fermented milk cultures. So basically, we don't know whether it's the bacteria that can be alive, whether they provide any benefit. We don't know what's in it. But we did know that it was a very high amount of cranberry juice extract, which has a simple organic acids that would actually directly interfere, interfere with her new medications and potentially increase her risk of a kidney stones. So oh. that's why, you know, it, it's um, getting advice on these uh, uh, over-the-counter natural health products from somebody that... Um, has evidence-based training and does understand your specific condition and your other medications you're taking is probably the best. And I'm, I, I did say this before we started. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's sad that we don't have a lot of you, Dragana, in pharmacy. <laughs> Uh, I'm hoping that your efforts to educate and to bring this knowledge to every pharmacy in Canada and the U.S. is is very impressive, and is we're very thankful that you're um, helping us as pharmacists get educated on this on this very very important subject, so that I can support my patients and I can support uh, our community with information that is reliable. Um, one question I also get from my patients. Uh, probiotics in the fridge versus probiotics on the shelf uh, and there's a, a like a general feeling that the ones that are refrigerated are better mm -hmm. because probiotics actually are very fragile and they cannot live at room temperature but most of my aisle is basically room temperature what do you think of that so this is a very common misunderstanding and very prevalent. I always have questions about that. And my, most of my patients believe that refrigerated products are better for some reason. Um, that's not true. So basically what it does, it is um, storage requirements are connected with the uh, strain uh, stability. Some strains are excellent, but they are not resistant to exposure to, to light, oxygen, or temperature. They need to be preserved, usually in the dark glass bottles, in a fridge. That way, we can guarantee that they'll stay viable for a long time, and once you take the capsule or tablet or whatever that is, it will provide you benefit. Other strains can be actually freeze-dried and completely dried, put in a capsule, and kept at the room temperature, and they'll stay viable until you actually ingest them, and then they become, they kind of wake up. And there are also probiotics that are spore-based that are resilient to exposing them to high heat. Even baking with them, they'll still be viable once they're in your system. Like so, what? I would like to know what I can cook with that, actually. Do, so, you, know, do you have one? <laughs> so there is actually, a, um, hmm, uh, there is a probiotic uh, uh, product available in states that has that spore in it. But you, most of us cannot really buy that strain and cook with it. That strain is added to different foods. So this is, you know, that one spore. But with spores, we also have to be extremely careful. We want to make sure that the spore is safe. Because we also have uh, products with spores that um, have shown uh, uh, 
uh, side effects with kids with immune um, suppressed uh, issues. So spores are, you know, could be tricky when you use the, the probiotics with spores. So check with those that really are listed in a guide or very safe. Uh, so that's why uh, storage requirement is base, based on, on a strain, you know, uh, 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 stability, nothing else. And, okay. you know, some strains can be viable and really effective at like a half a billion uh, colony forming units or, you know, the amount how we express the strength and others, you need 450 colony forming units to actually get the effect. So, you know, more the than is not important. While before they, we used to say, if it has more bacteria, it's better. And if it has more strains is better. That is not That's not science. true. That's not the science. We know now that some are great with a very low uh, amounts will provide benefit. Others we know needed in, in a higher amount. So more the merrier is not uh, a good idea. You know, when you say more strains, and I do see hear this from my patients, you know, if you have a broken faucet in your house, you're going to call a plumber to fix it. And you probably have their phone number to call them because you know they're good. That's your strain. Or maybe the plumber has an assistant, so they two of them will come and fix it. You do not call me, your grandma, your friends, your neighbors, and everybody to come and fix your faucet because it will be too many people here. Even if you have a good plumber in this group, he will not be able to work because you'll be all telling him what to do. So combination of strains, unless it's already proven to work together well, it's not a good idea. Many companies do that. They pick one strain with a good evidence and keep adding a few more just so they are different than others. And they can say, oh, we have many strains. Last thing I want to say, you mentioned pharmacists and doctors, but pharmacists specifically, because I'm a one, we have inquisitive mind. We have evidence-based minds. Even if your pharmacist is not trained in probiotics, they can learn very quickly. We will ask questions. We would ask for the evidence. We will be kind of nitpicking things that to figure out what's best for you. So trust your pharmacist, talk with your pharmacist, and, and you don't need to multiply me. We are, there's many pharmacists across Canada and globally that are amazing healthcare providers and probably misunderstood because people think we just count pills and do nothing else. You have no idea what pharmacists can do. Um, when you go to your um, website and, and the first thing that pops up is a, um, um, a recent um, uh, webinar uh, that is on um, probiotics and COVID and what happened to all of us who got COVID or got the vaccine. And a lot of us have seen changes in our bowel movement, in our bowel health. And uh, uh, overall, we don't fe we feel that there's an effect. What so so, so this, this is uh, uh, something that is coming up next week because we don't know the answers. There's lots of research published with very confusing information and results. And this is why we gathered, I would say, the best uh, uh, minds in this area. Uh, Dr. Gregor Reed, uh, Dr. John Damianos, Dr. Paul Wischmeyer, Dr. Jordi Asperari Mazo, uh, moderated by Dr. Peter Lin. We have invited a few other investigators, but you know, we have not heard back from them. So we'll have those people, those researchers and specialists present their research and their opinion and their expertise. And they will ask each other question and the uh, audience will be able to ask questions. So we are trying to figure out because research was done looking at using probiotics to prevent COVID or using it to minimize risk of complications or minimize long COVID or minimize um, gastrointestinal symptoms. Very confusing results. So that's why, because we don't know, we are asking experts. So it's a uh, free registration so anybody can register and we are really um, um, getting up with the numbers. So we hope that this will be uh, something interesting and we'll record this panel discussion and will be posted on the website as well later. That would be great because I still get uh, questions around um, COVID and what COVID, a lot of our community members have seen their, their headaches get worse and have seen that if they have IBS that has gotten worse. Um, possibly uh, Jasmine has a question uh, that might be our last question, which is uh, her migraine meds uh, actually give her constipation. She only uh, has a bowel movement once a week. Would a probiotic help with this? Uh, there are certain uh, um, 
probiotics that have a good evidence for constipation, I definitely would suggest to explore. I'm not sure whether you're in Canada or US, explore the option. Everybody tonight um, at, um, is, uh, is uh, from Canada, I think on Facebook at least. And I think this is one of our... Um, um, so, so yeah, the probiotic, uh, trend probiotic, and it quite often is, you know, it's a multiple or uh, multifaceted approach. If this is uh, um, causing, uh, you know, such a rare bowel movement, you know, making sure maybe even adding some kind of a, a, a peg fl flakes, uh, such as a Restorelax or Miralax would be a good idea, because I like those products, because you can actually tailor the dose, you take maybe just a teaspoon or half a teaspoon daily to make sure everything is moving properly. Eating a kiwi or two kiwis per day uh, with the skin is recommended by gastrointestinal associations globally to, to minimize risk of migraines. If you like a kiwi, that would be probably easy to do. Um, and, you know, trying things once, once everything establishes, they can maybe even stop probiot uh, probiotic and then maintain uh, the bowel movements with a, you know, good fiber kiwi maybe. Uh, and uh, I know that every, all, we, we keep on saying the same things. I'm just going to remind that magnesium uh, citrate, the one C for constipation. So citrate is the one that actually helps if you have constipation. And it's also a potential a preventive that you can add to your medications. Um, it, give it a try as well. I love the, ki the kiwi um, advice because we're seeing more... Um, reports from our patients saying that actually it does help and it's uh, it also is rich in vitamin C, fiber, and it actually does a good job. Uh, we have reached the end of our tonight's uh, broadcast, our webinar. We would like to thank everybody who's joined us tonight. And uh, Dragana, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. It's, it has been very informative. Um, I think that we will need to go to your website and learn a little bit more and have these guides and find out. And, and when we go next to, uh, to buy a probiotic, we're going to take a little bit more time to try and find the, desi the one that is designer kind of. Yeah. Uh, and, for and, what uh, and speak with your pharmacist. And you mean definitely speak with your doctor, but speak with your pharmacist as well. That will be absolutely something I would suggest. Absolutely. That's why it's called Ask Your Pharmacist. This is our um, monthly webinar where we are trying to um, encourage um, our community members to go and talk to their pharmacists and find pharmacists like you that have developed a knowledge that is um, advanced knowledge on a subject that is very important for our community. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for everybody who has joined us tonight. And we hope that this was useful for you. And we hope to see you next month again. Thank have you. Very, thank you. Have a very good night.